The problems facing New Zealand's primary sector have been mounting at a rapid pace. So I think it's time for open hearts and open minds. Kia ora and welcome to another week in Sarah's country as we head into the last calendar month of what has been nothing more than a game changer for the world. It's known as 2020. Now a shift in the world's power has been uh, rippling for years from you know getting away from big government, big corporate and this ground swelling participatory movement from social media to activism seems to be rewriting the new rules of the game. It is understood that New Zealand's Prime Minister will announce a climate emergency this week being described by the opposition as a, a PR stunt. But those who work in the field of marketing and media understand that public relations is everything in how the world works now. Facts don't buy attention. The consequences of decisions is too hard to care about, but the decision to do nothing is what costs you in the long run. Now, in a chess move today by New Zealand's news giant staff, they admitted a monoculture nature of the journalism that has not served Aotearoa well in the past. An investigation by 20 of its journalists into its journalism throughout its history has uncovered evidence of racism and marginalising marginalizing against Māori. My apologies. Uh, if you think the job of news media uh, in our company, Sinead uh, Butcher, the, the CEO, Boucher, my apologies, says, is to hold powerful to account, then we are the powerful. We really have had an enormous impact on shaping public thought in New Zealand and social norms, not just reflecting them. And I think it's only fitting that a progressive company can pause and have a look at itself. I found it interesting and I was very angry and frustrated re reading this and you'd think, you know, what a great and courageous thing for stuff to come out and point out that they had done a wrong and, and that is fantastic. Fantastic PR. But where I was angry was that they talked about so many things that we felt marginalised and had negative stereotypes and misconceptions denying an equitable voice in Aotearoa. And this is to the rural sector. And staff know that their journalism has been with um, unbiasedness, uh, has been with biasedness towards the sector. And it makes me so angry about the fact that they have come out with this when they haven't taken an overall investigation into how their journalism has been across all issues in New Zealand if they want to stop denying an equitable voice in Aotearoa going forward. So I issue a challenge to CEO Sinead uh, Boucher to be able to look into uh, not just those views of Māori and how they've portrayed racism in the past, but also how you have portrayed a very minor uh, culture that is left in New Zealand, which is rural New Zealand. Some may think that my views are extreme uh, and some may say, Hey, yes, Sarah, we totally agree with you. I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments wherever you are watching live. And at the same time, though, uh, must give kudos in that a news media organisation has acknowledged the importance of its flow-on effects of perception from its work and the amount of power the Fourth Estate do hold. So that, uh, you know, it is a way we are trying to do our bit here at Serious Country in alliance with the wonderful team at Farmers Weekly that do have that care of journalism in depth in its analysis of the matters that matter most to farming, food and fashion here in this beautiful country known as Aotearoa New Zealand. And I'm so proud to be a part of that movement we think is a game changer. Tonight on Serious Country in New Zealand, there has been a real focus on planting radiata pine as the main commercial species. After 7.20, we'll be joined by an ex-farmer and now consultant for Perrin Ag, who believes there are alternative species to pine for the One Billion Trees program, and how building a case study for a supply chain for things like redwood and totra can be something we, by we can achieve sequestration and biodiversity at the same time. 
And then after 7.30, the Agri Women's Development Trust proudly turns 10. Lisa Sims, the General Manager, joins us as we look forward to the next 10 years of enabling women to lead in our community with increasing complex challenges ahead. And to close the show, the dairy industry is confident that New Zealand's farm-raised venison has a long-term future. Deer Industry New Zealand's Chief Executive, Innes Moffat, joins us to outline the biggest challenges and the current situation. They've had a hell of a year. But firstly on this show, outgoing independent beef and lamb New Zealand director and food futurist Melissa Clark Reynolds will join us as uh, she says that farmers are having to operate with one foot nailed to the floor and one hand tied behind their backs. Melissa is going to share with us the challenges ahead, but there is opportunities abound. This is Sarah's Country. Growing a better world takes courage. It takes foresight and vision. It's about dreaming big, then being brave enough to follow that dream through. To create a world where food is plentiful, soils are healthy, and rivers run crystal clear. A world where we grow more with less, where livestock is tended to with care. Energy is friend, not foe, and waste is a valuable resource. This is the world you're already shaping through imagination, innovation, and determination. So as small steps become huge leaps, you move boldly forward. And Rabobank is there beside you to help grow a better world together. Really pleased we got into this. Thanks for your help, Dave. It's a good idea, honey. You reckon it'll come out? Cover it in talcum powder, leave it 10 minutes, and you'll be fine. Good call, Dave. Good call on getting those security cameras, Dave. You call a new one here? Yeah, kind of. When you've got decisions to make, we'll be there to help you make the right call. I'd go for those ones, Bob. Yeah, good call. Did you choose these? Oh, you know. For great advice and insurance, talk to FMG. Here on Serious Country, one thing we do love celebrating is a bit of moisture. And a lot of people I'm talking to today have got some. It certainly has been filling up the tanks and, of course, the aquifers across Canterbury. I'd love to know, as I know you love sharing with me, uh, what is that rain gauge looking like from your place? So I'd like a number and a location, please, live in the comments below. Now, Melissa Clark Reynolds is stepping down from her role as Independent Director at Beef and Lamb New Zealand at the end of the year, but she is excited about the future of the primary sector. With food service overseas under pressure due to lockdown, the emphasis has gone back on retail sales. L uh, Melissa joins us now on Serious Country. Kia ora, Melissa. Welcome to Serious Country. It's an absolute privilege and pleasure to have you on the show. Oh, good day. It's lovely to be here. I'm a real fan, so it's great to be on the show rather than just listening to it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. And can I just say, uh, mutual, um, you know, girl crush there too, especially on Lindy Nelson's great new podcast. Oh. I'm just going to give a wee plug there because I know she'll be watching. Amplifying Am us. Amplifying us. It is such a great podcast. Like the whole season is just interviews with phenomenal women. Um yeah, it's just, it's been a joy to both be on one and to listen to the series. Um, amazing. Yeah, I, Mavis Mullins. I mean, it's just all sorts of incredible women that she has been able to showcase um, because of her deep relationships in the sector. It's fantastic. I know, and I think we feel like we're jumping the gun because we're going to have Lisa Sims, a GM from Agri yeah. Women's Development Trust, later on in Sarah's Country um, to talk about Lindy's fantastic work. But, uh, I mean, an absolute segue uh, back into what we were talking 
working around our traditional markets being extremely disruptive uh, because of COVID. But I mean, you, you know, let's talk about your role as an independent director on Beef and Lamb New Zealand and actually bringing um, your skill set and background and passion for agility uh, to the table, especially in a year like 2020. Yeah. It's been an interesting year. So, you know, I work as a strategist for a number of companies outside of my beef and lamb directorship, and, and most of those are in the primary sector or provide services to the primary sector. And so in my futurist role, um, because I'm kind of nerdy, I have a Google alert for novel zoonoses. And so I'm constantly looking for like, what's the next M. bovis? What's the next African swine flu? You know, if we think about last year, last year we had a boomer um, year in the meat sector thanks to a global pandemic which affected pigs. And so the African swine flu impact is why we did so well in China as a country last year. So I'm constantly looking for those so that I can keep an eye on where I'm markets might get disrupted, um, where our logistics might get disrupted. And so in December, you know, I started watching um, what at the time just looked like a, um, a chest virus, basically, that had jumped from a bat to a pangolin to a human in China. And, and the first reports were about 27 people sick. But by early February, China had run out of containers. And so for the New Zealand meat industry, that's a really big deal because if we can't get product in and out of China, it, it's really important. And so I feel like it's been a long year, like it's almost a year since that first novel zoonoses came up. Um, it's only about two weeks off a year for me, having been thinking about this virus. So the disruption has happened in a number of ways. But what I would say is that this year will still be, if not a record year for the meat industry, pretty close to it. And so what we're seeing, thanks. It's like we've got a bit of a frozen. Oh. What was that? My apologies. You just froze. Um, oh, could you just sorry. continue so, on? Um, so what I was saying is that well, this year is going to be a boomer year for the meat industry as well. Thanks to massive disruption in American production, we're getting great prices in the U.S. So um, so the meat industry in the U.S. was the biggest cluster for a long time um, for um you know, for the pandemic. So they've had you know, hundreds of thousands now of sick people related to meat processing in the US. And so our ability to provide good, safe food into the US food industry has been enormous. So I know it hasn't necessarily gone into a food service, but it's going into supermarkets. Um, people like First Light who are doing direct to consumer, I think that's really smart. And I see that they're starting to launch more and more direct to consumer within New Zealand. Um, I'm on the board of Atkins Ranch as well, and we're having a really good year in terms of Whole Foods and Amazon. So I actually think this, the, there's been more opportunity in COVID for New Zealand meat industry than, than there would have been otherwise. It feels like to me, Melissa, that that was where the opportunity for our meat industry actually lied all the way along. COVID was the kick up the butt it needed. Well, I think um, I was kind of watching the food service thing because I think where food service um, as a target market is interesting is that a lot of countries don't eat lamb the way we eat lamb. They, it's like 3 or 4% of the American meat category is lamb. And so if you might choose it in a restaurant, you might have the courage to go home and cook it yourself. And so I think there is a lot of sense in New Zealand companies targeting food under the food service as a way of getting people to taste something new. However, this year, because beef has been so hard to get hold of, a lot of consumers have switched to ground lamb in particular. Um, I don't think New Zealand's going to be able to produce enough racks this year, um, which home cooks are really willing to do. And, and the winter is coming in the US, and I, I think we all know people eat more meat in the winter. So I'm, I'm really hopeful about not just this year, but next year as well, actually. Let's talk about um, volume to value. It's like a broken record in the primary sector in terms of our future. Um, but you are still dedicated to this and that that is the uh, future for New Zealand um, and, and really need to pull back and stop focusing so heavily on the move of plant-based proteins. 
Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, people are going to eat plant-based protein. And, and today I was posting a few things on Twitter where, you know, we've seen a skyrocketing of plant-based milk in particular. And um, oat milk is now the second biggest category of, of plant-based milk. That category is not going away. But what we also, I think, we should be aiming at is thinking if people are going to eat less meat, which they probably are, then what we want them to do is eat better meat and pay more for that meat. So ultimately, I think for farmers, what we want to do is we want to be sure that people have been paid the best income they can possibly be paid for producing really high quality animals. And so if you can get twice as much off an animal, twice as much revenue, that's better for everyone. It's better for the climate, it's better for our customers, it's better for farmers. So for me, that's part of that um, pushing to the top of the market. I want to come back to the US market for a second because this year what's really interesting is while meat prices generally have been high, they've been extraordinarily high for what's called claims-based meat. And so this year, organic meat, um, gap meat, non-GMO and um, non-antibiotic meat has all received an even higher premium well above the rest of the high prices that we're seeing. And so it won't be for every Everybody, but for some farmers who want to get that extra premium, they might have to put a bit more work in, like becoming GAP certified or going organic. Um, but there are much higher prices to be had in the marketplace for those claims-based meats, particularly in the um, pandemic era, because what people want is they want to be thinking about building their immunity. And as they're building their immunity, they want to buy what they consider to be the highest quality protein they can get. And what we're seeing is plant-based proteins aren't featuring quite so much in people's thinking about how to build immunity, but they do think meat. And then they do think organic or antibiotic free or GMO free meat is the healthier meat that they can buy. I found that found that interesting. So the words what they consider um, yeah. and based on the information that they have at hand uh, through yeah. the lens of their experience. One thing you say in this wonderful article, thanks to Colin Williscroft at Farmers Weekly, is around data and how we capture the opportunities of data but at the same time we really have to up our broadband to get there. But let's talk about data being that absolute gold mine of storytelling. It's, it's in a bunch of ways. So there's the storytelling, but there's also, if we look at, to say, again, the, the lamb industry in New Zealand, we've doubled our revenue off half the animals. And we've done that through massive genetics gains in particular. But you think if we can improve our genetic gains, and particularly, I think we need to focus on taste and genetics. So we need a lot of data to know, does China as a market like this flavor or that flavor? Do Americans like this flavor or that flavor? There's a whole lot of data we need to collect around the, the relationship between things like intramuscular fat, um, the genetics of the animal, the feed that that animal had, the weight at which it goes um, off to be processed, and then what happens post-process and how does that animal end up with the most optimal taste for that market. So that's one piece of data that um, that data will provide us with higher income right from the start. Then there's also all of the data we need in order to prove our claims. So how do we prove that this is a GMO-free animal? How do we prove that it's an antibiotic-free animal? How do we prove that it was grass-fed? And those data points absolutely need to be done. But also, there are are some others, like um, the amount that we waste. So if I I look at um, some of the milk production, you know, what if we knew at the animal level that this animal, um, that its milk shouldn't go into the vat? And at the moment, what happens is that we're testing a whole vat of milk rather than being able to personalise it to one cow. And so if one cow has an issue, the vat can be spoiled. Or even worse, on some farms, that vat goes into a tanker and maybe three or four farms' milk gets spoiled. And we could actually, again, like get a much higher price if we can reduce our wastage on the way through. It's interesting, it's interesting uh, just to all of your points, actually, I went to a great uh, launch of the Agritech um, Industry Transformational Plan uh, last week, and there was a huge part there around data ownership and how it will have to be both a carrot and a stick uh, to bring in the regulatory needs to make sure that the ownership of data is passed through that chain, especially when it comes to things like genetics and taste all the way through. 
Absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I think the, the ownership shouldn't stop us, though, from getting moving on being able to access the right tools on farm, um, being able to put the right um, scanners in and, and all of that. And this is, I just, I know I'm going to run out of time in a minute, so I do just want to talk about broadband. Um, you know, the Isle of Jersey, right, it, it had, um, they, were, they were one of the first that rolled out really rural broadband out to every farm on the island. And they now have an average speed of 218 megabits per second okay so 218 megabits per second is their average in New Zealand we have an average of about 14.7 and on top of that the rural broadband initiative is trying to get everyone up to 20 which is one tenth of the speed of what a farmer in Jersey has and so when we think about that and that's download speed not upload speed and this is a little technical but if we're going to really be able to do um, really good data driven precision agriculture on farm and I've been banging on about this for 10 years now um, then what we have to have is good upload speed as well because I have to be able to put my data up into the cloud it has to be analyzed and I need to be able to pull it back down I can't just have a download speed okay it'll be faster for me to watch Netflix on farm but that's not really what we're talking about here what we're talking about here is how do we pull our data in a way that be able to benchmark each other that we know that we've got high quality meat and dairy that is going out to the world and that we can guarantee its provenance. Those are the areas that will actually make us money as a country and we're being hamstrung by a ridiculously slow both upload but even worse our download speed. So for me if we're going to be able to get, uh, get irrigation right, if we're going to be able to get the genetics right, if we're going to be able to get feed right and if we want to get the highest prices in our market we have to have access to these data tools and these data tools can't work at the kinds of, you know, ridiculously slow broadband speeds that we've got. Um, so if you've got broadband, you know, I know Lundy, like they struggle on farm to even get broadband. Um, but if we're only aiming to get 20, 20 megabits, which is one tenth of what Jersey has, and that's what we're hoping to roll out now, we're going to be behind the global economy for a very long time. I was just thinking I might lead the protest to the steps of parliament because it only helps right. serious country streaming across rural New Zealand just as much. Help me in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Absolute pl- privilege to have Melissa Clark Reynolds on Serious Country tonight. And this is following the latest story from Colin willis Crofts in this week's Farmers Weekly, titled Challenges Ahead But Opportunities Abound, available now at farmersweekly.co.nz. Getting to your comments, it's fantastic to have you with us tonight. Uh, Michael Ross says, um, Sarah, reflecting on your challenge, have you refu- uh, reviewed your own past lens? I have spent time half of today reflecting on my own biased approach in the agri sector. Uh, Michael, to that I say I get to review it daily on this show uh, and that I want to tr- continue to try and do it with an open mind and an open heart and I know uh, sometimes it takes longer to shift than others but at the same time uh, that's why I absolutely love getting out of bed every day doing this job. Lindy, big ups to Beef and Lamb for choosing Melissa Clark Reynolds as your first independent director. Melissa, thank you for your challenge, the foresight thinking you have brought. I know you will have farmers in your mind going forward. It's going to be a privilege to wear, watch where uh, Melissa is involved in the primary sector. I know she won't be leaving it any time soon. And talking about taste, Freddie Smythe says, lamb smells yuck and tastes yuck. Steak is number one, Beef, he says. Um, Freddie, I want love, love, love love to bring you some beautiful tomato lamb, some beautiful Salerno Merino and as a um, growing up on a Merino station I would love to cook for you so let me know when I can come uh, and, and, and show you how lamb is done properly. New Zealand Farming joins us to say plant extracts aren't milk. I hear you however if we carry on banging on about this we're not going to focus on where the value lies for the current Uh, animal ruminant proteins that we do so well in this country. Up next on the show, it may be one thing to talk about the right tree in the right place for the right purpose, but do we know how to successfully integrate this into a variety of farming systems? Our next guest is an ex-farmer who wants to help farmers make changes to their systems whilst retaining a viable and profitable business. Daniel Payton is up next here with us on Sarah's Country. This is Sarah's Country.
Well, the philosophy of the right tree in the right place for the right purpose has been widely discussed, but the how we achieve that is the work of the One Billion Tree Program, funded by Te Uru Rakao, with supporting funding from Dairy NZ, Living Water, which is a Fonterra Dock Partnership, the Waikato Regional Council, Bay of Plenty Regional Council, Forest Growers Research Horizon Regional Council, and Farmlands. Now, Daniel started with Perrin Ag in June and brings both farming and business know-how to his first project, working as part of a larger team to complete work for the One Billion Trees program. This is an initiative that aims to increase tree planting across New Zealand, reaching One Billion Trees planted by 2028. Daniel Payton, welcome to Sarah's Country. Yeah, good day, Sarah. How are you? Good, good. Now, as well as your eight years of dairy farming, you have also been involved in various roles within the industry. Can you tell us about your background and what's led you to this role with Pear and Ag? Um, I suppose I'm a bit of a jack of all trades and master of none. At the moment, I consider myself a, a South Islander on my OE. I've been in the North Island for the last few years now. Um, probably when you marry someone from the Hawke's Bay, you can't quite drag them south. But uh, yeah, so I first started when I left Lincoln. I was actually in Rotorua here as a um, as a graduate working for Landcorp. That certainly led me to the sort of um, supervising large scale sheep and beef stations on the east coast. So I did that for a few years, both up here and then down in Wellington. Followed by the, the quintessential Kiwi OE. Um, followed my now wife across, chased her across overseas. And um, when we came back, I got into banking in Marlborough. Uh, that's where I'm from, originally top of the South Island, a place called Rye Valley, and, um, and yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it, but after a couple of years, I sort of got sick of being behind the, behind the desk, so I sort of jumped back into, into farming. I grew up on a dairy farm, so dairy farming is easy to get back into. I did that and um, sort of found myself going through the share milking and contract milking route, and then, um, so I spent the last five years in, in Taranaki there, and then... I suppose you've got to think a little bit more about yourself and um, my kids and my wife sort of put the pressure on a little bit and um, we sort of got out of that. The, the idea was to eventually head back into a real professional role and sort of this is where I found myself. I didn't think I'd end up back in Rotorua doing this by a new pair and it was a good company with a good reputation and um, so here I am really, yeah. And I suppose why I wanted to paint the picture is that you, you've got an ex-farmer um, hat bringing to it uh, some practicalities around a very ambitious goal of one billion trees. And when we're trying to achieve this right tree in the right place, um, the practicalities are at the table. Can you lead us down the path of the obje- uh, objectives of this particular study you're doing with uh, the One Billion Trees program? Yeah, so you've definitely summed it up. The, the mantra is the right tree in the right place. Um, so it is it is a project. It's sort of a – it's probably the most thorough and in-depth one that's been done so far, and it includes actual case studies. There's 10 case studies on actual farms, and it's to to actually do an in-depth analysis on how to, how to integrate trees, you know, tree planting into farming systems. Um, what we're finding, it's – you know, it's nothing new really that a lot of farmers, they do want to integrate forestry or tree planting into their, you know, into their existing systems. Um, but what we're finding is it's not just for economic economic gains or benefits, like a lot of it could be for environmental or aesthetics. So it's not just about planting pine trees and earning money from timber or carbon revenue. Like pine trees definitely have their place. But we're finding that, you know, the farmers, they have a lot of, what are other reasons as well? And um, it's just to try and find how the, you know, how the One Billion Trees project can sort of be practically applied, I suppose. It's an, it's an aspirational target that the government has set and how is it actually going to work on the ground? Let's talk about the particular varieties of trees and redwood has been uh, identified as well as totra. Um, what are some of those scenarios where it can be integrated uh, very beautifully within the farming system but still be commercially viable? Okay, so the redwood, currently there's a 
there's an emerging commercial market for redwood trees in New Zealand. So the New Zealand Redwood Company are doing a lot with timber. Um, overseas, it's huge. In California, it's actually an endangered species. Um, it's big for the domestic industry over there, so they have been investing in other countries. New Zealand's one of them. And um, it's also got a benefit as sort of carbon sequestration, so for, as a carbon sink, whether it be permanent or long-term. It's a longer rotation tree than, um, than pine. And for Totra, it's sort of an emerging one. It's it's um, We're sort of looking around natives for timber you know, for timber and, and biodiversity, really. Um, so one example of that is, is growing what we call a cover crop. So it could be manuka. And you get the benefit of you can either use it for sort of manuka honey or carbon potential, and then after sort of three years, you'll plant totra seedlings through the manuka, and it encourages the totra to grow upright. And over long term, we're talking intergenerational, really. It might be 80 years out, there's, there's timber benefit as well as, um, you know, a biodiversity benefit in the forest. What sort of work do you do with Pear and Ag and, uh, in terms of modelling um, these types of returns over various periods as well so that you do have that sort of scattered biodiversity plan uh, and bringing that into that freshwater management plan and, and, and a bigger ecosystem and holistic approach to the, to the farm is, um, systems in general? So we do, we do, um, we've got someone from P.F. Olsen helping us with the, the actual forestry, we have specialist help there for forestry modelling. They are partners in the project as well. And um, so we sort of do a full, you know, as a commercial forester, we do full long-term modelling, harvest scheduling, silviculture regime, everything like that. And also we do, we do the usual um I suppose the modelling in terms of overseer farm acts on farm systems see the impact of, of planting, say, marginal land and um, also for greenhouse gas gas emissions to see what reductions can be made because that's something that's sort of on the radar at the moment, um, fast approaching by 2025. Yeah, And that's actually a very good point because when it comes to that carbon calculator, so to speak, that Tutuwe and Varakira are bringing into the system, there's, a, as you said, a, a range of different sequestration rates of different types of trees. Um, is it sort of be able to be able to uh, pass on to farmers um, so that if they want to have a variety of native and exotics within their farm systems that they can have that sort of type of mapping of calculation? Or are we still at that point we're we're obsessed with radiata pine. Um, we are unfortunately, yeah. Like at the moment, nothing beats pine over the short term. It's it's something we've been breeding. You know, breeding pine trees for the last probably 80, 80 years in New Zealand. You know, we've we've definitely enhanced what was the original you know pineus radiata species to what it is now. But there's sort of been a lack of research and development on other species. Um, but also the the way that the the ETS um, how would you how do you describe it, probably calculates carbon sequestration. There's a there's a lot of difference there. Like not a lot of research has been done on other species, and that's part of the issue. Mm. Um, it's sort of starting to happen now. Like they have been doing sort of research on you know sequestration rates of different different um, native species. There's an outfit called um, Tane's Trees Trust that's been doing a lot of work. And also the way um, the ETS works is that um, they use lookup tables, which is just standardised standardised rates for native forestry, irrespective of what the actual species is. Um, if it's under 100 hectares, if it's over 100 hectares, they'll actually do samples, plot samples of the actual forest, which is a lot more accurate. So there's there's a lot of devil in the detail in the legislation. So unfortunately. Other species are handicapped at the moment um, until there's, you know, there's a lot more data out there. Hmm. Hey, thank you so much, Daniel Payton, who is a, now a consultant with Pear and Ag and, and a former farmer, joining us there on Sarah's Country. Uh, yeah, some fascinating information around sequestration rates and how much more work we need to do in this space. Um, uh, probably to our listeners and viewers of Sarah's Country, probably no surprise, but it sounds uh, like the right people are at the table looking at this uh, and to support farmers to be not only environmentally on the right track, but profitable 
businesses as well. Now, after the break, what has been done to transform the role of women in New Zealand's primary sector? Well, our next guest on Serious Country will is Lisa Sims. She's the general manager of Agri Women's Development Trust, who proudly celebrate turning 10. I look forward to sharing with you uh, Lisa's thoughts on what the next 10 years will look like. This is Sarah's Country. Uh, A quote from our next guest that I really love. We don't need to talk about diversity and valuing the other 50% of the sector. It's just simply understood and happening every day. Women not only feel like they belong in the primary sector, they are driving the collaboration and sense of purpose that helps others belong to it. That is, uh, of course, our next guest from the Agri Women's Development Trust that has been empowering primary sector women for a decade as they celebrate their 10th anniversary this month. They have achieved a lot in those 10 years, graduating 4,500 rural and primary sector New Zealanders through their programs. Lisa Sims, General Manager for Agri Women's Development Trust, joins us now from the mighty uh, region near Ikatahuna. Fantastic. And your broadband and uh, just following on there from Melissa Clark Reynolds earlier, is uh, incredible. Um, Firstly, Lisa, what's it been like continuing through COVID for AWDT? Well, it's been a a crazy old year, Sarah, as as all of us know. Um, And we've actually managed to continue incredibly well um, by taking some of our programs online and some good timing around some some of the modules that we had on our leadership programs. March, September kind of worked. And we've done a lot of rescheduling. We've rescheduled literally hundreds of women and and a few men. And we've ended up putting around, still achieving our target of around 1,000 people through our programs in in 2020. So our team's pretty exhausted, uh, but but they're pretty satisfied in in what we've managed to to get done this year. That is absolutely incredible because it all began with the wonderful Lindy Nelson, who's uh, stepped down from her heavy involvement on a day to day with 10 or 11, I think it was in 2010, to over a thousand women. Uh, what an absolute mammoth task. Could you paint the picture of uh, the basis of the trust and what it has set out to achieve in the past decade? Yeah, so as you say, it was it was founded in 2010 by Lindy Nelson and with the support of our patron Mavis Mullins and then they put their heads together with, with a few other women and really decided that they wanted to do something with the research that Lindy had had done through her Kellogg program over, over a few years and they launched the you know the trust out of parliament with a, you know with the real purpose to empower women to create you know, create progress and change in the primary sector and in communities and they started with eleven women. Of the escalator program, and you know that was that was the that was the first program. And as as time went on, other programs were research designed, and then began to deliver. The team of of, of facilitators was built, and it, it sort of grew it's exponentially, I, I guess, over the years to the point where now we're we're working with about around about a thousand women and some men um, each year. So it's been a it's been a huge effort, and uh, there's been what, what we've really noticed, I guess, is that there's there's just there's just more and more demand as more and more women understand that you know that they can step up and, and do some contribute in different ways and bring their thinking to the table and in, in, the, in the sector which is you know we need we need all of our people to contribute and be able to feel confident to do that. And that is the absolute thing I love so much about Every Woman's Development Trust is it's not an elitist governance program uh, whereby it's about trying to get more women on boards. It's all the way down to behind the farm gate of women being able to have kitchen table conversations on the business's direction with their male husband uh, and be on an equal around that right down to 2,200 farming women being able to measure farm performance 
performance and improve profitability through understanding your farming business. It must be so rewarding. Um, can you share with us some of the sort of um, evolution that you've seen in these women and this growth and, as you said, empowerment, some of the stories? Yeah, and there's some there's hundreds of stories. Um, some some well known, some others. But let me just let me just touch on one. One of our first participants in understanding a farming business was a woman named Sandra Matthews, who many of your listeners will will know or know of. Um, based in the remote, farms in the remote um, region of Tairawhiti near Gisborne, she came on understanding a farming business. She got in the room with a group of of, of other women and understood that she wasn't alone in in, in the isolation that she felt and that the. the things that she wanted to do to really use her, her skills that she'd gained in her career and on her farm to, to, to do something more. She then came on, a, on another program called It's All About You and Sandra went on to form her own um, her own group of women, starting with a group of, of, of women that she did those programs with and that's, that's expanded to an organisation now called Farming Women Tairapati. Um, and that's a sustainable organisation. It works with around 800 women in that region um, with ongoing connection, support, learning, connection to industry. And Sandra's recently stepped back um, as the chair of that after five years and, and succeeded herself and, and to the, you know, into new leadership for that organisation. So it's about creating that ripple effect. And, and there's lots of stories like that. Sandra then went on to do our Escalator program. She's now serving on the Beef and Lamb Farmer Council. And she's one of our facilitators. Um, so she's using her experience and her knowledge and her skills um, to really empower other women through through our programs. So that's you know that that's that's a great illustration of of you know how women go away and do different things that creates that that ripple effect um, in empowering other leaders. It's it's interesting because as women like men, we're all individually conditioned from a young age differently. And listening on the West Coast at the um, the ladies' evening, Katie Milne telling her story. It was the first time I'd actually heard Katie's um, real early history. Twenty three year old Annie Lennox here, only woman in the room, telling these old men how to get things done. Of course, the first female president of Federated Farmers. But not every woman is built like that or has been conditioned differently to that. And I love your quote around it's just about creating women as powerful agents for positive change without need for permission or position uh how the 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 value systems of agri women's development trust is unique in that absolutely and you know as you say we it's not about leadership's not about having a position it's about you know doing things differently and leading people on whether it's on your farm and a health and safety, um, you know, improve your health and safety on a farm. Whether it's to to support, you know, your partner by 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 becoming more involved in the business. Um, and so there's there's a whole lot of things that women can do, and we often don't see ourselves as leaders. I know when I came on the Escalator program in 2012, you know, I had I'd had a career, I'd married a farmer, I still had my career. I wasn't that involved in the farm, and I'm still not. Um, but I, you know, I, I came on Escalator and I didn't see myself as a leader. I, you know, I thought a leader was someone who, you know, had a high powered CEO position or something like that. And, and, you know, and I've learned that, you know, there's, there's other things you can do. I, um, you know, I never actually imagined that I would be leading this organization at that point. And that's, that's a whole nother story. But I think, you know, there are, there are so many women, um, out there who have something more to give, something more to offer. And, and it just needs sometimes a little bit of, of connection, confidence, and and some some understanding what their strengths are, and really understanding why and where they want to contribute. And once that happens, um, a whole lot of magic starts to happen. Oh, it's so exciting. And of course, we are celebrating 10 years of Agri Women's Development Trust. And I know that your vision will be wider than just the next 10 years. I mean, what does um, great look like into the future? Yeah, so you know, our vision is around women being vital partners in a, in a New Zealand primary sector that's world leading, and c- communities, New Zealand communities, rural communities that are really thriving. So you know, by 2035, you know, what good looks like is is a significant, a significantly larger number of women leading in positions, and they are they are important leading on our on our boards. Um, that's already happening, but but we need more to bring that new thinking, um, leading in, in management positions, but also on farm and in communities. So so productive and and uh, profitable farming businesses that understand you know how how to care for the land, that understand the connections to their markets, 
but understand what they need to do to hold on to their staff and support their staff. And, um, you know, there's, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of what good looks like um, across those, you know, across those, those different areas, but, but really having, having women as, um, as a vital partner. So it's not about taking over from the men. It's around, it's around playing their part um, and bringing that, that diversity, the different thinking um, and connecting to, to really make um, our sector you know, as good as it can be. Thank you so much, Lisa Sim, General Manager for Agri Women's Development Trust there with us on Serious Country celebrating uh, the past 10 years of what has been an incredible journey and the output, uh, if you want KPIs, I mean, there is a massive graphic. Take a look in this week's Farmers Weekly full page showing 4,500 graduates that are now vital partners from the farm to the board table. Now, that is something that is called a legacy. Uh, Absolutely, congratulations to, as she said, Mavis Mullins and Lindy Nelson and the great hardworking team behind Agri Women's Development Trust from Lisa all the way down to those regional coordinators who all want to give back. Now, coming up lastly on the show, uh, how do confident does the deer industry feel at the moment? It's been, as I can only put it, one hell of a year. CEO for Deer Industry New Zealand, Ines Moffat, is with us next. This is Sarah's Country. One of the first things you learn when you live out here is where to shop and the things you need to live out here. Like electric fencing. Or horsey. Or bee suits. Children. Chuck food. Do you want a couple of these? Or something stylish to wear. Not everyone's got stuff like this. But at Farmlands we do, and then some. So if you need anything to help your farm... Grow, milk, dredge. Rear! Come on in. Because we're out here too. Every morning, Kiwi farmers wake up to produce higher quality food. Yet every night, some Kiwi families are going to sleep hungry. Meet the Need is a charity founded by farmers, and it's here to change all that. We're about New Zealand farmers feeding New Zealand families by donating a small part of what we grow when we can. You can help us make sure no one in New Zealand goes to sleep hungry again. Visit meettheneed.org and follow us on social. Well, we've started a little bit of a debate back and forth in the comments of Sarah's Country's live show, which, of course, Monday through Wednesday from 7pm. For those listening on podcast, of course, please join us. Head to seriouscountry.com for all of the details. And, of course, put together an alliance with the fantastic team at Farmers Weekly. The comments going back and forward is around uh, whether lamb smells yuck. Um, and now Jock Innes has jumped in to say, yes, Freddie, you need to eat Merino. Uh, it's pure as driven snow. I'm glad you wrote driven and not yellow, Jock. Um, but you are completely and utterly correct. And yes, Michael, there are some things I will continue to be biased towards, and it is Merino meat. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, with the COVID-19 resurgence disrupting our key venison markets across Europe and the US, New Zealand venison processors and marketers are making major efforts to again find new outlets for farm-raised venison cuts. So what sort of future will farm-raised venison have in New Zealand? Uh, in a retail space, Deer Industry New Zealand Chief Executive in a Moffat joins us now on Serious Country. Sorry to use hell of a year, Innes, but I couldn't find any more adjectives. It certainly has been. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge, uh, but it also provides us with lots of uh, pretty exciting opportunities as well. And I think that's what we're really focusing on at the moment. You're singing off the same song sheet as our first guest, Melissa Clark Reynolds, and she'll like that. Um, but, you know, let's paint the picture on the current situation. I mean, what are we now eight months on since lockdown? Yep, yep. And it's been a tough year for New Zealand uh, deer farmers. Um, Venison does go to Europe. It is primarily sold through restaurants and many of those restaurants are closed at the moment in what is our peak sales period. Uh, So that is a bit of a challenge. But the venison marketers have also had eight months to be finding alternative markets and we are seeing a lot more here on the New Zealand market. Um, Our sales to China um, have increased 
quite remarkably and September this year was the, uh, the, the biggest volume of venison going into China ever. So there are certainly some other opportunities out there. Yeah, okay. So, you know, how patient do we ask our deer farmers here in New Zealand to be, though, and with that crystal ball, uh, how long could this take to rebound to what was looking like some absolute records um, prior to that? Yeah, one of the things that we're pleased about is that deer farmers really responded to uh, the marketing company's call and got a lot of deer away in September and October. So they've got a bit of a bre- bit of breathing space over the summer um, until we see a wee bit more clarity and uh, some of those restaurants and food service establishments in Europe and North America open up in the new year. You know, the market isn't broken. Um, it, the, there is a bit of a temporary um, uh, halt to some of our sales. Uh, but when some of the product begins to move through as people come back, to uh, dining out and uh, going going out to catered events again, then the demand for New Zealand venison is still there. One of the things that Dairy Industry New Zealand is doing is um, providing additional funding to all of the venison marketing companies for a big push into retail in North America. Um, we haven't really had a concerted push into retail in the States before, so all five marketing companies have agreed that we can put a lot more effort into growing that demand for our natural, healthy and delicious New Zealand venison um, and and supermarkets in the USA. So that'll kick off in the new year. Um, And just again, as I was following on from uh, Melissa Clark-Reynolds, who was earlier in the show, speaking about that lamb was enjoyed and understood in restaurant environments to then for take home as that in-home experience. Uh, For uh, a a meat such as venison that that they're unfamiliar with, how do you tell not only the story of how New Zealand's farm raised is unique, but also how to cook it? Yeah, and that's one of the things that's really good about venison is it is really easy to cook. Um, I uh, I dipped into the dipped into our local supermarket chiller the other day and picked up a couple of packets of um, cutlets, threw them on the barbecue for about three minutes each side, let it rest. It was absolutely delicious. Um, so the cooking uh, uh, is is pretty easy to do. But one of the things that the companies are doing are they they're starting off with more familiar sort of products. So they're presenting it as venison mince, ground venison, as they call it in the States, uh, but also putting it into some formed products as well. So some meatballs, some patties, and also perhaps mixing it in with some other slightly more familiar meat so that um, people can be buying something which is within their normal repertoire, but it's got an element of the exotic about it as well. Mm. We look at what the bison uh, industry has done in North America, where they've taken a very um, uh, unusual or uh, not commonly consumed meat and really turned it into a supermarket staple. And we think that that will open up some paths for our venison as we, as we begin to um, expand the retail range up in North America. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. Um, and Annette Scott has covered over on the same page on Farmers Weekly also around uh, that the deer velvet is looking positive amongst what's going on. We had Reese Griffiths on the show uh, not that long ago. How are things looking going into the new year? Yeah, it's still looking okay. Um, we hear um, more confirmation with each week that goes by that our venison marketers, uh, sorry, our velvet marketers are selling a bit more. You know, the season still isn't really into full swing. Uh, some of the large volume buyers are still a little hesitant uh, because of some of the economic uncertainties in the Republic of Korea and in China. Um, but we're pretty confident that things will tick along. Uh, this won't be a record-breaking year for Velvet, um, but returns are still okay for, for most producers. One of the things that we're most excited about with our Velvet is the introduction of our new traceability system, um, Veltrack. Uh, it isn't being it isn't introduced yet, um, but it will be rolled out over the over 2021, uh, and that's really going to underpin New Zealand's reputation for good quality, uh, good animal welfare, and also good hygiene um, on on the farms. So that's going to be a bit of a uh, a positive step for the velvet industry in the year ahead. Um, and I know that uh, Velvet is one of many of New Zealand's products that has um, a, a race against counterfeit products as well because it's got such a huge reputation. Will Veltrack sort of plug into blockchain and, and provide some security around, you know, that it is absolutely New Zealand Venice, uh, Velvet? 
Yep, it, it, it is a, a pretty sophisticated traceability system. Um, it's not blockchain. Uh, I don't quite know what blockchain is, but this is uh, a, a from farm to processor to export market um, RFID traceability scheme so that every stick of velvet which is exported from New Zealand will have its own unique identifying number. So that if somebody's picking up that stick in the marketplace, they can have absolute confidence that this has been produced in accordance with our high animal welfare and food safety standards uh, and has been and has come from New Zealand. And how is the perception around uh, wild game and wild meat etc in Wuhan China at the wider China um, has that started to settle down and have the Chinese been able to understand the amazing health benefits uh, of both venison and velvet for what it is farm raised yeah yeah, we, we were certainly very pleased when the Chinese authorities recognised uh, farm-raised New Zealand venison as an approved species, an approved meat, uh, earlier in the year. And that certainly opened up um, the importation pathway and also the pathway towards um, a few new channels. Uh, we wouldn't go so far as to say that everybody in China knows that New Zealand uh, venison is um, is farm raised, uh, but we're making some really good strides in getting chefs and some retailers much more uh, familiar with the cuts which are available from New Zealand, and um, we're working out which of the numerous different styles of Chinese cuisine that venison really fits in the best so that we can then be taking some preparations to chefs who haven't normally worked with good quality venison before and show them how they can you know, turn out some dishes which are really going to impress uh, the guests in their restaurants. Fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us, dear industry CEO Innes Moffat. And uh, May 2021, bring some wonderful times ahead for our dear farmers because I tell you what, I know a lot of dear farmers in New Zealand and they are not only pioneering but resilient uh, is a great word to associate with them. Um, and so if you ever want to learn a thing or two on navigating uh, the, the seas ahead, talk to a dear farmer in my mind. That's all we've got time for. Uh, on Sarah's Country on your this particular edition tomorrow on the show. Uh, it's, it's quite fruity, actually. Clive Jones, the chair of New Zealand Wine Growers, joins us as they smash through that $2 billion target that they had as an export industry. 19% increase in wine sales uh, and no surprise with how COVID lockdown went for many but in particular into China. Tony Hayes of United Flowers, Gr Flowers Growers shares his successes of the flower online auction system. Looking forward to talking to Tony about that. Uh, Rupert Handyside is a farmer from Masterton who I really was looking forward to talking to tomorrow about the field day focus on farm irrigation in the Warapa. Uh, he'll talk to us about the findings from the field day uh, soon and tomorrow, sorry. And Tim Jones, Chair of Summer Fruit New Zealand from Cromwell, uh, fo fo following this approval of the 2000 seasonal workers from the Pacific Islands to work in New Zealand. Sounds great as a headline. Keep reading. I'm not too sure. Really looking forward to breaking down the economics of this with Tim Jones. Do we let the cherries rot on the ground or pay for a very expensive quarantine process for that period of time from, can I say, a COVID-free Pacific. Until that, take care wherever you are around the world and, of course, beautiful Aotearoa New Zealand. In the meantime, good night. Go well. This is Sarah's Country.